This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Joining us today for a cup of coffee to talk about the fifth episode in the book of Boba Fett, titled the uh, return of the mandalorian is the return of our mandalorian tom gross oh hello what a what an intro yeah this was great you know i tuned in uh tuned in how old school is that like i went over and i i turned on the tv set <laughs> yeah sat on the sofa <laughs> that's right Hey or kids, uh, can you, my can you grab? <laughs> that's right. Could you grab the uh, antenna and hold your arm up this way? Yes. Now I tuned in and I thought I had the wrong series. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is what this is what we're gonna do. <laughs> we're gonna break mold a little bit. We'll, we'll we'll start with our letter grade and our overall reactions, and yeah. then I'm gonna address that point because I've heard that more in the past 24 hours than any criticism, good, bad, or indifferent about most shows star wars marvel oh. whatever i want i think we need to address the pink elephant in the room or the pink um Ooh. womp rat in the room yeah. probably more accurately yeah. so tell me your letter grade and overall reactions oh my overall letter grade this is what i've been waiting for a plus baby i loved this episode it totally you know i had some expectations and this blew expectations out of the water. And can I tell you, uh, maybe I should save this for later, but I'm going to do it anyway now. I'm going to say, okay. I would like to say, I am more excited to see Boba Fett in episode six than I've been to see Boba Fett since episode one. Ooh. I am so pumped to see him after watching episode five. Because... All of the events that let that that go through episode five lead back right back to how is this going to play in and how is this going to change Boba Fett's story? So I, that's I guess that's my my reaction. It, it was it was such it was such a pleasant surprise. I am going to give this an A plus. And I'm going to just fall down out of pure joy with my hand on the plus button and, and <laughs> just have a, a blissful coma for like three hours. And then when the pluses stop, then I'm really going to start hitting the pluses. Oh, it was exceptional. It was mm. absolutely exceptional. Yes. I loved every second of it. It made me realize quite a bit uh, about my feelings for Din Djarin and the series overall and just what it means to have effective storytelling. I okay. am. I'm trying not to yell because I don't want people to have to turn the volume down. Oh, but yeah, this was, this wasn't border. This wasn't Luke Skywalker excited at the end of Mando season two, but it was pretty darn close. Thomas <laughs> W. Gross Esquire, pretty darn close. Oh, yes. Exceptional. I loved every second of it. Every second of it. All right. Mm. So, I want to address something that you said. Yeah. And a lot of people have said this to me. I've, I've read texts. I've read stuff on social media. People have emailed me. People have stopped me in the halls. And the, the basic gist of it is that was so cool. That was my favorite. But Boba Fett wasn't in it. Why wasn't this the Mandalorian season three, episode one episode? Why wasn't Boba Fett in it? Blah, 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 blah. How do you feel about that? There, by the way, there's no right or wrong answer, but I, I have a... An, oh, me personally? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I, did, I had no problem with this whatsoever. And, and my, my remark is just, you know, <laughs> it really felt like a Mandalorian episode, but it's in, it's in the veil of Book of Boba Fett. So it, and, it, and everything led to, as I said in my initial reaction, everything that happens in this episode leads to, you know, the concluding scene, which we'll discuss. And so 100, 1000% fine with this, uh, with the, having a Mandalorian centric episode, because it's going to play so, so significantly in, well, I mean, I'm assuming it's going to play so significantly into the conclusion of the book of Boba Fett. And so 1000% fine with this. I, I loved this. I loved the technique 
Um, and, and like I said, it, it makes me long to see Boba Fett now. I want to see these two come back together. And I'm, I'm hoping that happens. I think there's a, I like that. And you actually said something that I hadn't thought about, which is this is making you excited to see Boba Fett again. And that's good. I think that is, I think that is one of the chief objectives of the episode. Hmm. And I've seen it uh, several times now and that didn't hit me that way. But now that you have, it's sort of illuminated that part of my brain. So thank you for that. No, you're welcome. I, there's a lot to unpack. I'll try to keep it brief. Star Wars is a shared universe. It's a big mm. sandbox. In these Star Wars films, there are many protagonists. There are many heroes. Now, I understand that this, this show is called The Book of Boba Fett. The main character is Boba Fett. But if you don't have foils and side characters, then you don't really have much of a story unless it's Tom Hanks on an island with a volleyball <laughs> named Wilson. Right? That's about the only way that that's going to work. So you have uh, a lot of stuff here. And we've known for a little bit that Disney Plus is basically going to have almost like a Mandalorian shared universe concept. Right? We're in season two. I think I could argue, I think fairly convincingly, that season two was called The Mandalorian. But there were many times where while he was a main character, he wasn't always the main character. I mean, Ahsoka got more screen time probably or just as much as Din Djarin did. Bo-Katan certainly got a lot. Cara Dune did. Fennec Shan got a lot of screen time. They all do. It's still called The Mandalorian. He still shows up. Both of doesn't even show up in this episode. What, to me, when Star Wars takes a trope of storytelling and makes it different and subverts it, that can make people nervous, and I respect that, and it can be confusing. That being said, I like that. Like, I think that's fresh. Star mm-hmm. Wars is obviously our bread and butter, and we love it. But it, we need we need some Star Wars adrenaline. This episode gave me that. And it was because of our emotional attachment and intellectual attachment to the Mandalorian himself. I like Boba Fett. I like him infinitely more because of this series and because of Mando Season 2. But, the, but Boba Fett... Let's be clear, he is not Din Djarin. Din Djarin is dynamic. Din Djarin is multifaceted. Din Djarin is compelling because we have 20 episodes of him. No, no. Yeah. No, there's eight episodes. How many episodes? There's eight episodes. <laughs> eight per season. Yeah. Eight. So, yeah, so we got six. So I'm an English teacher, not a math teacher. We've established that. I have... <laughs> Six, we have 16 episodes that are basically in 45 minutes on average long. Yeah. That's a lot of time to get to know someone. Even with the little bit we have of Boba Fett in this series and the other, and briefly in the Attack of the Clones and some Clone Wars stuff and Empire and Jedi, it still doesn't add up to the same volume and body of work as the Mandalorian. They're not mm-hmm. the same character. I love the fact that the Mandalorian looks like Boba Fett, and that's how the popularity started. But he far, far eclipsed the the Boba Fett character because he's a much better character. In my opinion, he's a much thicker, richer character. And I'm speaking strictly as an English teacher here. So when I see him in this episode, I I, I didn't know. No, I don't know if I want to say that. But he is the character that we love. I think that Star Wars needs. And Everything the Mandalorian is involved with makes me realize more and more how essential he is to where we are in the Star Wars universe as fans, as uh, Star Wars culture, and as a mythology. So if he didn't show up, obviously it would be a problem. The fact that Boba Fett doesn't there should just make us hungry for the next part. And I still say you can't judge a story until you've read the story. This is chapter five. How many books have you read five chapters of and decided, I like this or I don't like this? And I'm going to make a decision about the entire book. Well, that would be inauthentic. That would be anti-intellectual. It's not going to work. So it's sort of a long, weird rant way of saying, thank goodness we had this episode. This episode was more interesting and more compelling and more buzzworthy than anything in that we've seen in the, in the book of Boba Fett, besides chapter two, which is excellent. It's mm-hmm. all been good. Some has been excellent. The Mandalorian is another level. We need that shot of adrenaline to make us care even more about what is happening. Until we see the whole book, 
Okay. Every Star Wars book that you read, every book that you read that has multifaceted characters, there are going to be chapters in the book that don't focus on the main character. If this is truly a book, then this is how it should be laid out, isn't it? It's brilliant. I was, I, you, you just articulated what I've been trying to put my finger on. And that is when I was watching this, I did have those thoughts of like, why is this, why, why hasn't, because I just assumed we'd have kind of like the Ahsoka episode when we met Ahsoka in the Mandalorian starts with her. We get the story set up with her, but then we cut back to the Mandalorian. I kept waiting for that in, in this episode, I kept waiting for Boba Fett to show up and it never happened. And what it, what it made me do is think about why, why did they call it? Why did they title this series? The book of Boba Fett. I mean, we have the Mandalorian, we have the Clone Wars, we don't have anything else that is established as the book of, which I found to be an interesting, in fact, um, well, it, it, it was just an interesting choice. And so as we were going through this, it brought me back to that question. And what you had just said, not every chapter in a book is about the the protagonist. And that's that's what I was trying to put my finger on is 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 this doesn't have to be about this doesn't every episode doesn't have to have the action involving Boba Fett because one thing we know is they're looking for muscle and this guy's the guy they previewed. I mean, they foreshadowed this. And so why not? If, if you want muscle, this is who you go to, (laughs) right? That's who you go to. If you want, um, Boomerang fish, you get that sh- that weird mud- Muppets character that has the like the frilly <laughs> thing around his neck. That's where you go for boomerang fish. This is Indeed. where you go for muscle in the Mandalorian frame universe. So That's right. I think it's great. I think it's mm-hmm. very bold. And thank goodness, we, if we didn't like this character, it wouldn't work. But you've got so much emotion and buy-in, you know, from the past couple of years of history of storytelling, that this works and it makes you care. Right? Yeah. You care. We care about the Mandalorian. If you don't have that buy-in, then this falls flat. But it's we need the Mandalorian's emotion to get us to care about the main character Boba Fett. Now, is that a problem? In the is that a flaw in the Boba Fett storytelling? No, because that's who Boba Fett is. Mm-hmm. That's who Boba Fett is. And then when we when they try to add more to who he actually is, because we knew nothing about him before, then people get confused. And that's what Star Wars does. Like it when you get new information, it may mess with you because you're not familiar. It's happened to me. Happened to me with with episode one. It happened to me with episodes seven and nine, not with eight. Um, so I get that. But take a deep breath and let's look at the whole story before we decide where it fits in the pantheon. Let's do it. All right. Is my rant officially over now? I think so. Concluded. Period. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about the intro and the entrance. I I want to say that as soon as it started. Uh, and the silhouette walks out. It was wonderful because I thought this is a silhouette. They're messing with me, but are they messing with me? That's Boba Fett, or maybe that's the Mandalorian. I don't want to think that because if I'm wrong, what a bummer. And then they part that little that opening. You mm-hmm. hear the music, and here he is. I want to talk about that whole entrance all the way till the fight is over and his leg is injured. Talk, talk to me about. What stuck out for you? How did the entrance work for you? Oh, the entrance was magnificent because there's so many, you know, the silhouette of a Mandalorian is the silhouette of a Mandalorian, the helmet, the shoulders, the outfit. And so I was looking for in that, what, two seconds, one second of his silhouette before he pushes the, 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 the hanging, you know, the freezer door flaps open. And what the thing that I went to, my eyes went over his shoulder to where the gaffy stick would be. And I thought, oh, that's me. I was like, okay, I was kind of expecting Mandalorian. And they didn't give us any tease. There was no like music that involved when he stepped in front of that and you see the silhouette. I mean, they really were playing with you there. And then when he steps through and you see it's the spear and I'm like, oh, the spear, that's what tricked me. I thought that was the gaffy stick. <laughs> But it was, it was a, the entrance of a hero. W- wouldn't you say? I mean, I just felt like there, there he is. And you just feel, because you're kind of wondering what, what does the Mandalorian do next after 
after his purpose is done. I mean, the you know, as far as we knew, the armorer and the forge were up uprooted, and so he doesn't have that home. Now we know otherwise, but but it was it was such a a, a heroic entrance for him, and just the way he marches through. I mean, we've seen him do this how many times now? The opening of season one, the opening of season two. He's he's on the hunt. And here in this episode in Boba Fett, he's on the hunt. And we're like, we've seen this before. This is not going to go well for somebody. And it's not going to be Din Djarin. He's going to get his guy. And he walks in. And then uh, you want to talk all the way through the fight, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so the next question that comes to mind after he drops the line... Um, I can, I can bring you in, in warm yep. or I can bring you in, bring cold. You in cold. Corey I Club's mean, favorite line. <laughs> that is magnificent. I almost said it out loud. It's almost like, you know, a, um, you know, a dirty, hairy line. Yes. Yes. How many shots did I take? Do you feel lucky punk? I mean, you just, oh, you know, what's going to happen. And so right when he says that, I think, what weapons he going to draw? I know what he has. He's got a lot of toys. Except for you know, Which no we see dis- later, <laughs> no disintegration, <laughs> right? No disintegration rifle, but he's got some pretty sweet toys. And then there it is, draws out the dark saber, and I, I felt that this fight brought a lot of realism to who the Mandalorian is, and it brought a lot of realism to Star Wars, because I kind of had forgotten about how how Din Djarin has a habit of getting himself in deep. Um, and and putting himself in bad odds, um, you know. Thank goodness for Beskar armor; otherwise, Din Djarin would never have made it this far. I mean, I counted five headshots in this battle, either to the mm-hmm. front of the head. One one goes off the temple of his head; the others go off the back or the top of the helmet. Like he'd be dead five times over in this, mm-hmm. but he knows his limitations. But where the realism of the story comes in is, you know, the hero walks away in a romantic story, walks away after a battle like that, you know, lifted chest and guts. He's got the the prize. No, this he is not. He is not good with the dark saber. He has it. He uses it and he slices himself. How many times as a kid did we ever talk about? The, the Jedi and how do they train themselves and how do they not impale themselves with those lightsabers? At least I don't know about you. I've had those conversations with friends mm-hmm. and here he does it. He s- slices his, his leg open. Like it's in a slicer, you know, a ham slicer or something. And, and it's bad, but he gets his guy and it's a violent ending. I mean, Holy smokes. I don't know that we've seen him quite so violent um, in any other scene that I can think of. I mean, he's, he's left people in peril when he hangs the guy in the street while the creatures uh-huh. in episode one of the second mm-hmm. season, you, you know, you it's, it's all implied the horror of it, but here he does it. I mean, he's got the dark saber and he, he takes care of this dude. He's bringing him in cold and it's just, it's a magnificent battle. It, it's, it brings all of the feelings of the, of the Mandalorian back to the forefront of the story. If you want, if you listen again, or if you remember the first episode we did of the book of Boba Fett, I, my, my chief challenge with it was that I didn't get a hero entrance for Boba Fett. And you remember Corey said, well, he's not a hero. Why? But that's not what I meant. I don't mean like a good guy. Bad right. guy. I mean like a heroic, Hey, here's the tough guy. You know, let's, let's see him presented. You got it now. Yeah. You have it now with the Mandalorian and it's, it's perfection. It's absolute perfection when he, his, his swagger, like Pedro Pascal, the way he walks and carries himself is an absolute marvel and, and a wonderful study in body language and yeah. posture and, and how you fill a room that the Mandalorian fills that room. And I, and when it happened, I, I, the thing that I always do, I'm surprised Mason so wants to watch these shows with me. I kept saying, <laughs> I can't believe it's him. I can't believe it's him. All the way him to him talking to that Klaatuian, I kept saying, I can't believe it's him. I was so happy, so happy. And then I, then Mason and I start talking a little bit, and I say, so is this before Grogu or after Grogu? 
And then he ignites the dark saber. And we said, oh, yes. And he gets so excited about it. And then he just goes to town and it's and there's a lot of brutality and ferocity, mm-hmm. but there's not anger. It's just, he's just a warrior. He's just a, yeah. he's like a, he's just a, a powerful, powerful warrior, a superior warrior. No wonder they want him for the muscle. And it's just a, it's just a thing of beauty to chore- to watch this choreographed art. And we haven't seen any fighting like this in this series. Zero. Even Black Chrysanthemum or Chrysan, I guess they're calling him. Right. We don't even see it with him. This is just, it's strong, it's powerful, and it's not necessarily graceful, but it's athletic. Yes. And and it's just a marvel to watch. And after knowing what I know, watching it a second time, I noticed some hesitation with how he was swinging that sword. And I assumed it was because of just a lack of training with a lightsaber because you, you know, anybody can pick up a lightsaber, but then be in tune with the force. That's where it happens. Cause as we, as we know, or maybe you don't know, but you know, the Kyber crystal uh, helps to center a Jedi during battle. They connect to each other. That's one of the reasons why the Kyber crystal is encased in a lightsaber itself. Mm-hmm. Um, so when it was done in the ferocity of it, I was struck by a couple things. I was struck by, again, the fighting itself and the fact that he had the dark saber. But I was also struck with the fact that you could tell he had evolved as a character. The way he showed mercy, uh, the way he was willing to try to parlay, and, and the way that he was, he really, really probably brought this guy in alive. But because of all that stuff, he wasn't taking any chances, and then it becomes a Ginsu knife situation. And, and the Klaatuin was the penny, I guess, for the Ginsu knife. So that was amazing. And then he lets them free. And then also you see the title return of the Mandalorian. I don't think you're going to find a, a cooler intro to introduce or reintroduce an audience to a character. And the best part is I wasn't expecting to see him. I mean, I was expecting to see him, but you don't know how much we didn't know when season three was going to go out. So this was everything I needed. And, and if this is what people wished at the beginning of, of chapter or of season three of Mandalorian was, you know what? Maybe not. Maybe whatever they got planned is better than this. Maybe we have to go through this to get him to a different place for season yeah. three. And I thought it was great. Absolutely great. 100% agree. I, yeah, I, I have nothing else to add about that opening. Just what a great intro re intro. So I want to talk about all the way up to when he gets reunited with his old friends. Friend may be an interesting term, but we'll revisit that in a second. Uh, he, he's injured his leg, as you said. And, and I was surprised that when it happened, I, first I thought, well, isn't his leg covered by, I guess, well, just part of it is just like a, a real night, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And I would, like you had mentioned how funny that that's, we've never seen that happen with a lightsaber before because everybody that uses a lightsaber is a force wielder. So mm-hmm. that's not probably not going to happen. And the, and I, I kept thinking for a while, why do we even have this scene? Like, why does he injure his leg? What purpose does it serve? Uh, do you have any ideas there? I, I have one theory. Well, I think it, you know, it, it kind of ties into the, this is the next section of the episode, but I think it shows that, you know, the power of, of the dark, the, the dark saber, it, you know, in, in inexperienced hands, it's, it's really dangerous and you can, you know, injure yourself, but I'm, I'm sure there's more to it. And, and like I said, I think it, I think it ties into when he does go and see the armorer and some of the scenes there. Yeah. The only reason I can think that it would happen is I, I really think that I expected the Mandalorian after Grogu left and we never see it, but I sort of pictured once we met this character again, I sort of picture him like on an Island with his helmet off and the big old beard and not like, not like grumpy or like Luke was in the last Jedi, but just kind of like more like in solitude and very Zen and, and just reflecting mm. on Grogu, but, but not really being like sort of out of the warrior game, but seeing him like this yeah. and seeing that he's still ferocious and he hasn't been, uh, you know, neutered by any stretch of the imagination, but he still has his compassion that he's, that he's wielding equally with the dark saber Showed me shows me what an advanced and elevated consciousness this this character has. Pretty pretty neat, like pretty unique. Uh, I don't mm. we don't have a lot of characters like that in fiction, so I really like that. 
I just think the only reason it was there was to give a little bit of peril because after that intro, what are you worried about the Mandalorian? He's so powerful, but if he's hurt and he can barely oh. walk, then mm. you're worried. So it creates a, a quite a bit of tension until we get to the armor. Uh, so that, to me, that's sort of what I think. But so I want to talk about the reunion. Uh, we learn a whole lot about the lore of the Mandalorian and the dark saber. And usually for these things, I write like three fourths of a page of notes. I wrote three full pages front to back. <laughs> because and, and mo- the majority of it is based on this duel and the reunion with the armorer. So, I guess talk to me about what stands out to you. What do you think is important? All the way until he leaves his people. Any just anything in there? Sure. Uh, well, I have to say, on a personal level, I was really excited to see the armorer again because. After between now and after episode or season two of The Mandalorian, if you recall, my daughter and I got our picture taken with Emily Swallow, uh, and who plays the the armorer. And so I was like, dude, that she's like th- that character is back. And I just I love that character so much. I love the way she portrays the armorer as just a stoic, unemotional, um, you know. Uh, uh, would you say matriarch of the clan? I mean, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she just, she, and she just has this power that she actually shows. I mean, she showed it when she fought the stormtroopers, um, but they're stormtroopers here. We see that, that she just doesn't, isn't a warrior, but she can also train as well. So some takeaways that I have from this reunion. Um, first of all, you really get a feel for, you know, <laughs> what's left of the clan. It's the three of them. Um, and that's kind of, kind of, fr- you know, it, it's kind of sad, I guess. Um, but you, there's some things that, that happen here because of the size of the clan. You'd think that maybe some exceptions we would be made to some clan rules or vows, I suppose. And so the first is th- they, you know, uh, is it pa- Paz Vizsla, who, yep. by the way, when you talk about muscle, I mean, that's the dude with the muscle, but yep. not quite the same type of cunning warrior that mm-hmm. Din Djarin is because mm-hmm. it's almost a draw. So he he claims and he wants to duel for the saber because it was created, we learned in the lore, uh, it was created by Paz Vizsla's ancestor. I don't remember mm-hmm. How far uh, down Tar Tar Vizla for Tar Vizla yeah, forged right. over a thousand years ago. Yeah, with and with a Beskar that the Mandalorian doesn't recognize. So, mm-hmm. ooh, a little more lore to the story there. But this this duel is really significant in my mind because again, you're looking at a clan of three, and you're gonna bicker over this this sword, and so. Mm-hmm. I guess one more thing that shows the influence and the power that the dark saber has. I just, I love how the dark saber has this legend of its own. It's like a, a sentient lightsaber. I mean, in ways it's, it's very different than all other lightsabers. No other lightsaber that I'm aware of has this flat feeling like classic broadsword kind of blade it's black. The, well, am I, maybe I'm forgetting someone, but no, you're not. You're not. The way Fine. the way it pulls out of the hilt is very different, almost like coming out of a sheath mm-hmm. rather than a an ignition like a, other lightsabers ignite. So it has this lore of its own. So here in this duel, you you really get a sense of the importance of this. Another takeaway I take take from this is 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 the story of Bo Katan. And how the armorer um, really, I don't know, I'm going to use a, a pretty lame expression here, but throws her under the bus as far as, far as as far as taking blame for the Night of Thousand Tears. I mean, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't split hairs here and basically says she's responsible for the fall of Mandalore and our people. And so it does make me, so the next step in my mind is, what will Din Djarin's reaction be to Bo-Katan? Because I'm assuming that that is not a that that relationship is not over. You know, mm-hmm. she did everything but say we really would like your help in liberating Mandalore at some point. 
And so my expectation is somewhere along the line, the Mandalorian was going to have some hand in that. But now I wonder, I mean, he's basically, and then I guess the last thing I want to say about this reunion is it seems to be that when there is a, a duel or a fight in the clan, the armorer questions the loyalty because in episode one, when the two with these two fight, the first question at the end, when she halts it is, have you ever shown your face here? We have that return to that after, at the end of this duel, she stops it. Din Djarin has won. He's got the knife to the, to uh, Paz Vizsla's throat. And her first question is Paz Vizsla. Have you removed your helmet? Interesting. I would love to know. I would love to know the motivation behind that questioning other than the only thing I can make of it is it is a symbol or a sign of loyalty to the clan. And they, it's a clan of three. They kick him out, but we learn that there is one way. How does he say a tone? He says, is there any way I beg forgiveness? Mando, mm-hmm. uh, the Mando Din Djarin says, I beg your forgiveness. Is there any way I can atone for this? And she says, the only way that I know is to, what is it? To gather the living waters in the mines of Mandalore or below yeah. the mines of Mandalore. Right. I mean, you want to talk about a Dungeons and Dragons adventure? I see the module right there, man. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's, I mean, there's a wonderful story there. And boy, I hope somewhere we get to experience that. If it's so, if, if Din Djarin so deems that that is necessary. Isn't it fascinating, and I'll get to this here in a second, but isn't it fascinating that the fall of the Jedi is also the fall of the Mandalorians? It's pride Mm. and putting rules and creed above people and relationships. Yeah, Think about that. The Mandalorian and the Jedi both like that. And they even make a comparison where, you know, when she's talking about giving, you know, giving Gorgu, and she says the way the Jedi is to you know not have attachments. Forgo attachments. Yeah. yeah. And then she and then Din Djarin says, but the way of the Mandalorian, and I don't remember his exact words. I got it right here. So there's there's a bunch of things that that the armor uh shares with us that is just so rich and so beautiful. And that's why I wrote so much because I, I kept pausing, I turned on the captions and I wrote down everything that she said. Uh she said, isn't it interesting that the empire lasted, you know, the, we heard so much about this empire the last three years. We lasted over 10,000. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like that. Uh, and so then when she, when they, when the dark saber is revealed, I didn't realize the dark saber was made out of Beskar. I mean, I don't know that that was ever, that was never said. No. So that was interesting. But she said, if it's won by Creed, cause the big thing at the end of season two is, so what's the deal? Why does Bo-Katan have it? What about the whole thing with Sabine? Um, what where do we go from here well he's got the dark saber so where that's where we go with it is he's got it yep. so she says if it's one by creed in battle one will defeat 20 multitudes will fall before it if not one in combat it it um it says it falls to the undeserving if, so that would be moff gideon i would think mm-hmm. and will be a curse unto the nation which could possibly be attributed to the night of a thousand tears, I would sure. say. Um, and then it says Mandalore is, uh, it says it's laid to waste. And then the rest of the Mandalorians are scattered to the four winds. So all over the globe, right? It's very tribal. Uh, you know, I feel like it's got a lot of uh, rich native American heritage behind this, which I, I mean, a thousand tears. How could you not think of the trail of tears? Sure. That? You know, one is fiction. One is a real black mark on the history of the United States of America, which we talked about. Yep. But again, fiction puts a lens on that stuff. So yeah, over a thousand years ago, Tar Vizsla forged this thing, but he's both a Mandalorian and Jedi. So then uh, Moff Gideon, not sorry, not Moff Gideon, uh, while, while Paz Vizsla is healing the Mandalorian with some sort of a Bacta infused spray, I'm not really sure what it is, um, he says, well, he's sent to the new Republic, um, to face justice for his crimes. And, you know, the first question he has is, did you kill him? No, I didn't. He's, yep. he's got sent. You can see right there 
that the Mandalorian still respects and loves the Mandalorian ways, but he's also evolved a little bit. Mm -hmm. He's moved beyond one black and white concept and moved beyond because he's seen more things, right? Right. He did. He's seen more things. Uh, So as she says, you know, where do you get that spear? Where'd you get that spear? That goes, cuts through Beskar, that Mandalorian, you know, Beskar is used for armor, not for weapons. So we need to take care of this thing. What do you want to do? And I thought he was going to say, I want some more, some better armor for my legs. That's the first <laughs> thing I thought he was going to say. He says, no, I want it for a foundling. And all of a sudden you're like, ding, ding, ding. Here we go. Uh, she talks about the man, the mythosaur rising up. Uh, while she's forging this, uh, and I know I'm just going to make summary, but there's a lot of key stuff here that I think needs to be uh, said again. Absolutely. Uh, Bo-Katan is a cautionary tale. Uh, she laid claim based on blood and sword, which is traditionally the way that these monarchies and, and feudalism and things like that. Well, feudalism is more about land, really. Um, but this is very King Arthur, this concept. Uh, the sword was gifted to her and not won by Creed. So there we have it. The thing that was scratching in my head and, and had so many people rewatching. Uh, you know, season four of Rebels repeatedly, mm-hmm. including myself, to figure out what what am I missing here for the lore? We've got it. You know, it's gifted to her. And I remember that scene. We remember yeah. that scene from Rebels. Mm-hmm. But it's not one by Creed. So so she did, was not worthy. And you can tell, by the way, Bo-Katan acts, she doesn't feel like she's worthy, uh, which is why she's got that unusual affect when she sees it, Din Djarin has it at the end of season two. Yeah. Uh, so then... Uh, let's see. So basically, as you mentioned, Bo-Katan is thrown under the bus. She's blamed for the loss of Mandalore. Only the the sect cloistered on the moon of Concordia, which is, I'm pretty sure that's one of the places in Rebels. Uh, that's the only reason they survived this great purge. And then we get to see Tom. We get to see the Night of a Thousand Tears. What do you oh, think of that? That was so haunting. Very and the haunting. only thing I could think was the Empire. I mean, we, we've talked so many times about the, the cost, the environmental impact of the Empire in mining planets for these massive Star Destroyers, mining planets for the Death Stars, and all of their engines of war. But here, it's not. They're not mining. They are, dis- this is destruction. I mean, mm-hmm. th- tell me that those weren't nuclear based, you know, explosions. I thought of Thrawn. I thought like, I feel like this is Thrawn's behind this. It just, oh. the way, the way the stuff that happened on Lothal and stuff like that, it just, yeah. that just has his mark. Oh, and I just, I just really thought it was very, very haunting and scary it, you know mm-hmm. it just mm, i mean when you think about it, so this is this is the beginning of the empire so they had to put their they had to show that they were a force to be reckoned with and what better way for the empire to do that than to take one of the most legendary cultures of the mandalorians 10,000 years and absolutely annihilate it and that's what we saw in the night of a thousand tears devastating um and after that flashback which i I couldn't believe we got to see it that was very powerful yeah very emotional upsetting uh then she starts to he says i want to go visit basically he mentioned he says the word grogu yeah and which is magical to hear and then she Mm -hmm. says it almost like with a bit of confusing and and a little bit of contempt emily swall does a great job Her, her her vocalization here is great he says, she says, the Jedi f- forgo attachment to master the force. You can't be attached to the master of the force. That is certainly as we know it to classically be. And then he says, that's the opposite of us. Loyalty and solidarity is, is our creed as followers of the way. He doesn't say that, but that's what he means. It's loyalty versus solidarity, which is brings me back to the point that I said earlier. Yeah. So they, they, it's, and it becomes on display. We we see that there's little these little chinks of armor, and then you, your mind starts to reel at these possibilities. We won't go into that too much because hopefully it will pay off soon. Yep. Uh, I want to talk about the training I put on Twitter. I think this training sequence with the dark saber is full of metaphor. You're an educator and a, a well-read youngster, so tell mm-hmm. me what tell me what you made of this particular fight. 
And I'm talking about, let's talk about the training first. I mean, yeah. the fight with Paz Vizla is important, but nowhere near as important as this, this very brief training session that he has with the armorer. And I, and again, it's full of interesting stuff. Yeah. I, this, um, I'm glad you mentioned it because I, I've completely forgot about it in my notes and in, I think I was so enthralled and just watching it on the screen that I just didn't take note. I, I, how could I forget? Um, it was a magnificent scene because I, the, my mind went directly to here. We've been talking about Jedi. The, the creator of the black saber was a Mandalorian Jedi. And I really felt like this was, this was a, a, a training, a Jedi. It felt like a Jedi training and, and she's using the language of, of fight. Now, I don't know what any of those moves or names of those moves meant, but she was stepping him through all of them and he's struggling and you learn. And this takes me back to the opening sequence because he's dragging that, that dark saber in that opening sequence and he's doing uppercuts with it. You know, if you were a baseball player, you'd be saying level out that swing. (laughs) <laughs> and but we learn that there's purpose to that that the mm-hmm. that the dark saber again i mentioned earlier that that it seems to be sentient and here she reveals that it does have some sense of sentience or or something in it that it recognizes when someone of skill has it versus someone of no skill and so the more swings he takes with muscle the heavier it becomes and she tells him and i hope you have the language she tells him that once you stop swing, once you stop using your muscle to to force the saber to fight, it will it will lighten it will lighten itself and become yours. And so she's really trying to. I think you know when you think of like mantras, you use mantras to clear your mind, and and you're following you're following a flow. And so she's using the that mantra of fight the. The shah overhead. The next is the is the sideways, and then the uppercut. And she's getting him through that, but he's struggling with it, and it gets heavier and heavier. And I just it just took me back to Luke's training. It took me to Ezra's training from Canaan, and so many different uh, Jedi that we see train. Um, and so that's what that's what I took from it. But I I, I can't wait to hear <laughs> your your thoughts on this. So when she's they're fighting, um, the saber, as you said, is very heavy. And when you when you look at it through that lens and you watch the opening fight again, you will you'll actually see that on display there as well. Uh, and maybe that's part of why he can't control it. Uh, she says, "You're fighting against the blade. It cannot be controlled with strength. Mm-hmm. Your body is strong, but your mind is distracted." So then you ask yourself, "What is he distracted by?" Mm-hmm. He misses Grogu. I think that's clear. I, I ultimately think this dark saber sequence and the fact that this thing's too heavy, this is a metaphor for the line that he's walking. He's literally think about it. He's on a bridge. He's walking a tightrope, isn't he? It's a balancing act, right? So yes. think about that. It's a balancing it. act between who do I want to be? Who, what is my role? Am I a follower of the way? Am I a Mandalorian? Am I Din Djarin? I'm a dad, right? Who am I? I think we know who he is. I think he knows who he is. But you still kind of have to give yourself permission when you're with people that are your elders or that you respect. It's a nice metaphor for growing up, too. And so when he's fighting, I think the weight of this Darksaber is the weight of the responsibility of the Darksaber itself and what it means and the heavy legacy of it. I don't think the Darksaber is sentient by any stretch of the imagination, just like the Falcon isn't sentient. This, this Darksaber is is powerful because of the force. Din Djarin is not a Jedi. As far as we know, he is not force sensitive. So that that's where the, the weight is because it's a Jedi thing. It's a Mandalorian thing. And he, he likes that. He respects that. But he has another path. So to me, he's battling against the weight of the story. Stories have more power than anything in history. Stories do. Stories start wars. Stories have created lots of chaos and lots of power and lots of inspiration. But this real responsibility that he's fighting against, whether he realizes it or not, is 
do I want to be a follower of the way? That's my take on it. the fact that it takes place on a catwalk is a great example. There's like three metaphors in there. And, and a lot of this I realized, but thank you for helping me to kind of flesh it out. Oh, I mean, holy smokes. You have thought about this. You have written the essay in your notes, I'm sure. That all makes such sense. And, uh, and yeah, I, thank you for sharing that. That is, that is unbelievable thought, but it, it really clarifies a lot of that scene. And, and yeah, I don't I like the way of that, that it's, that he's fighting the story. I like it's, it's, it's a beautiful mm-hmm. way. I like, and I really want to go back and watch that again with the, with that thinking, because a story can truly weigh you down. Yeah. Um, and and the creation of that story sometimes can can weigh that can weigh you down as well. well Stories done, prevent people. Thank you so much. Stories prevent people from following their dreams. Stories prevent people from getting out of the way of trauma. Stories uh, carry a lot of power, right? And he cuts through it. He has yeah. to. So uh, you mentioned the, the the helmet thing when uh, she says right away. You know, has your helmet been removed? So as wise as, as the armor is, and I'm still not convinced that maybe she's having a bit of a, a turmoil as well, because when he leaves, she turns her back to him. But mm-hmm. when he, she he meets her, she has her back to him. So mm-hmm. I don't know where she's at. I, I hope that she is able to grow past it as well. But like you said, if their way is so special, there's only three of them. And they still want to fight. Yeah. They still want to fight with each other. No, that doesn't seem to be a, a good idea. It doesn't seem to be a good idea at all. So he is called when he says that I have taken off my helmet. What I like about this is he doesn't explain it. Yeah. He doesn't panic. He doesn't beg. He does say, Hey, how can I atone? And she says, you got to go. I think I wrote it down. There is, you've got to go down to the river, uh, the living waters beneath the mines of Mandalore for redemption, but they've been destroyed. In other words, you can't redeem. She even says, you are a Mandalorian no more. The, the weight of that sentence yeah, weighed heavy. me down. And I was watching his body language. He, 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 didn't, he, didn't, he didn't devastate. Uh, his bulk didn't shatter, but it clearly affected him. So he's called an apostate right away by Paz Vizsla, who saved yeah. the Mandalorian's life. And maybe he's, may, perhaps he's bitter about it all and losing everyone, but I don't know. Maybe he just wants the sword. I mean, he's kind of, he isn't, he's not as much of an intellectual uh, philosophical thinker as the Mandalorian is at least. But an apostate is a person who renounces a religion or a political belief or principle. So by that definition, I guess he is an apostate. It's clearly said with, with venom or malice is probably a better thing. Mm-hmm. But he walks away. They clearly see he's got the dark saber, which he won by creed in battle. And she moves to the side and lets him pass. Doesn't try to stop him. Doesn't try to say, you don't deserve that lightsaber. None of that. It's just done. It's just done. I can't imagine we've seen the last of that. But there's, a, there's a lot of weight there. We've got, we've got a lot of great stuff that we've talked about. Yeah. Uh, for my money, that, that entire sequence with the three of them is, is about as good as it's ever gotten in Star Wars storytelling. And mm. I, I think it's brilliant. Uh, I agree. It was... It was un, unexpected uh, when when he goes. And by the way, that that setting of that space ring, holy cow! What a mm-hmm. what an amazing Star Wars setting. We haven't seen anything like that, to my knowledge. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, I mean, I, when he was when he went there, I really I kind of thought that this is where that Boba Fett would catch up with him. And so when he gets into this uh, and he finds he, he finds the secret messages and the wall that lead him to uh, the armor, I just thought that was great. One more aspect about this that I thought was really cool because I found to be super symbolic in the first two seasons of The Mandalorian is when Paz Vizsla and, uh, and Din Djarin rebuild the forge. Yes. Um, it's, it's so symbolic of their culture. It's mm-hmm. so symbolic of the armorer's power. And when they, when they light that up, it just brought, uh, it raised the hair on my arms of just like ex- kind of excitement of like w- the meaning of that. 
And so, but I agree. This was this was a magnificent part of the story. The lore was heavy. And as you said, I knew there was something special in there. I wasn't looking for the metaphor, but boy, you ought to write a book sometime uh, <laughs> about Star Wars and metaphors and things like that. <laughs> I'll look into it. <laughs> you do that. You do it. Maybe you got some connections somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I love well day. The fun is not going to stop, but we've got a lot more to talk about. We're, only, we're barely even halfway through this episode. But we've got a lot more to talk about. So let's take a quick break, take a breath. And when we get back, we'll return and talk more about the return. I'm sorry, return of the Mandalorian. This is Coffee with Kenobi. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. We are back talking about Return of the Mandalorian, a spectacular episode, chapter five in the book of Boba Fett. Uh, Tom, the Mandalorian goes through airport security. I mean, who has ever been at a, in an airport since 9-11 and had to take off their shoes or their belt or remove their laptop or iPad? But you haven't had to do this. No. no. T- let's talk about that. I mean, for me personally... Uh, I, 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 I love the comedic value of it. It also helped me to see how the Mandalorian feels about being, um, ostracized from his Mandalorian coven. Uh, he seemed okay. He, again, he is an evolved character, but, but seeing like, an, um, those droids from that we've seen a lot in this series that are of course in Ogus Cantina and famously from Star Tours. I, I thought it was great. I thought it was great. It- and I'll tell you, after that, after that sequence with the armorer and Paz Vilza and the clan, I needed this. I needed a little levity. And so, and I noted on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the, what is it called when they put the words on the bottom, uh, the closed captioning. Yes. I know how the name of this droid is the bell droid. Yes. I mean, how appropriate, but it's, it's so and it was more the humor was more on his side on on uh Din Djarin's side he's like all right give me the ticket and he just starts unloading and all of the things and it was great it was like i'm trying to think where have we seen this before what famous character is completely loaded with weaponry that we don't see that they just keep taking like the knife out of the sleeve and they take this. It was just like that. He just keeps loading the box. Yeah, what full is of, that? I, I, it's the matrix has something like it, but that's it's, not, it's a class. It's, it's a classic yeah. scene and it, yeah. it was so magnificently done. Cause he keeps putting it. And then he turns to the droid before walking onto the ship. And he says, I know everything that's in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just thought that was great. The other thing it did for me was it shows me, the the um the the uh, the 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 cost of losing the razor crest he can't mm. just go get on his ship and leave he has to do no. public transportation I yeah mean, how many times have we had to do something like that where like our car's in the shop so you got to get an uber or you got to get on the bus or you got to call for a ride here he is you know on the galactic scene he's he's hitching a ride with a public transportation quote unquote bus and so it's a little humbling for him, but it allows us to have a, a nice scene where he's sitting there. And so the Rodian child is is looking, peering over the seat at him, and it, you can tell immediately that he's not annoyed by it. He's definitely thinking of Grogu, and he, you see him take out the pouch that has the Beskar gift that the armor had put together that is a mystery, but I, this may, I may be making things up in my mind, but the way she packaged it, it's in a little ball with a tie on the top. And when it's held, when it's sitting in his lap, it, it really kind of looks like Grogu's head. I want hundred percent. It is. It okay. absolutely <laughs> is. And when you watch it again and you see her first handed to him, same thing. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely I, same thing. I just thought I was making things up there. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I think it's, it's a, you know, so it serves a lot of purposes, um, all of this. And then we get, of course, the humor of the end of the flight where he has to retrieve his, um, his uh, weaponry 
And that bell droid has quite a, a quite a monologue of of things to say to welcome you to Tatooine. And so is this I wanted to ask, is this a transport ship that we've seen before? It just seemed to have kind episode. of a roundish look. I don't know. Just in the book of Boba Fett is the only place I've ever seen it. Yeah. Okay. But so that's, I mean, that's what I took from it is it, it sort of humanizes him. It shows, it shows, you know, what happens to you when you lose, you know, you're a bounty hunter and you lose your wheels, so to speak, you become an everyday fellow. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And it, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I liked the, to me, things like this add more to star Wars, just seeing sort of how things work, but not, not making it too like human or like earth ish, but just more like relatable. Yes. You know what I mean? So then we get, we should, he gets back on Tatooine and you've got Peli Moto is there. Oh and Peli Moto is a show stealer. I mean, Amy oh. Sedaris is, is brilliant. Um, but that's not the only shock. This, we haven't talked about this yet because the majority of them are here. But this entire show is Easter eggs like we've never seen before. I mean, this entire episode, we've got you've got the Clone Wars. You've got Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order with BD the droid. Yes. Hello. You've got, obviously, Phantom Menace. You've got stuff from the OT. You've even got the, the security droids from Rogue One that are walking through during the Trail of a Thousand Tears. That's right. Uh, combined with probe droids. And that kind of looked like the beginning of Terminator 2, that little thing with the fire and all that stuff. Oh my gosh, uh, there's a whole yes. bunch more of them, too. And it was... It was great. It was great. Oh. Who knew Womp Rats were so frightening, by the way? My goodness. <laughs> right? I, this, this whole scene with Pelimoto, I had to watch it twice. Because the dialogue... And the rapid fire of the die. I mean, her rapid her her speech is just rapid fire as is. But he was he was going toe to toe with her as far as the rebuild of this of this ship. Did you? I'm sure. Did you recognize what it was before she ever pulled the cover off? I did. I, I thought I knew, but I yeah, also I thought it could have been a pod racer too. But but I thought well, no, it's more shaped like a, a Nabu starfighter. Yes. And so let me ask this mm -hmm. question, if I may. They, so they rebuild the Nabu Starfighter, mm -hmm. which I thought was absolutely magnificent. I Genius. love the, re the retrofitting of it and, all, and everything. But tell me this. Those engines are not Nabu Starfighter engines. Those are the engines of a pod racer. Am I correct? No, I, I, I mean, they're they're like... The engine is like a big upgrade. So maybe it is. Maybe it is. I didn't actually write that down. I just um, thought the way it sounded when it started up was like yeah. the sound of Anakin's. They showed the internal with the turbine spinning, which we saw in the Phantom Menace when some of those pod racers started up. I just said, I, and, and they had like this oversized look to the Starfighter. And I just thought, mm. those look like pod racer engines and so and then they give us the scene of going through beggars canyon which anakin goes through it's like wow there's just oh, so much to grab onto here it was just yeah and with the weight of the armorer scene this was just such a, a breath of fresh air but can i step back half a step and ask you D did you think this is why he was going to tatooine or uh, my mind went okay this is where boba fett he's going to go see Boba Fett because he needs some direction. No, he's going to get a ship. You know, you told me you're going to give me a replacement razor crest mm -hmm. and she's been looking. So that to me, that's why he goes up, but it, it's okay. not serendipitous because that's where fit is. I don't know that he knew that Boba Fett was going to be there per se, but you know, the, the, the N one Starfighter is, is a win because it's, it's off the grid. It's pre empire. So it's off the grid. So right. it's, it's undetectable. That's going to be appealing to a guy like the Mandalorian. Um, we also learned that Pelimoto dated a Jawa, but they're just very furry. It's really <laughs> disgusting. And she really, you got to watch their face when she does that. It's hilarious. And she's great, obviously. <laughs> um, 
And then uh, let's see. We also learned that the pikes have caused such a, a problem on this planet that everybody's afraid. And mm-hmm. that doesn't bother Jawas. They just go and rip stuff. I didn't realize this, but one of the things that they're holding at the end is the same thing that Han Solo and Luke use, or Han Solo and Leia use to brace the trash compactor as it's smashing together. Oh Similar, my. same device. Now that talk oh. about a deep cut. Yeah. Wow. I know. Wow. So this cool. this episode has so much rewatchability. Uh, and uh, this reminds me, I'm going to do another uh, DNZ rant, but I haven't heard it said yet for this, but this isn't fan service. The term fan service to me is, mm. is, is ridiculous. It's ridiculous yeah. because, and I don't mean that as a pejorative towards people who use that term, because I think when you're using the term and you listen to the show, the odds are pretty good that you're saying it lovingly. But when the word fan service, the term fan service is used derogatorily, I find that anti-intellectual as well because it's a connected universe. It's not fan service. That's yes. the mythology. That's all the tools yes. in the toolbox. That's all the, the toys in the sandbox. You've got to use all that stuff. Otherwise, you don't have mm-hmm. a connected universe. You know, when, when Spider-Man catches Captain America's shield, that's not fan service. That's part no. of the story. It's that's storytelling. part of the story. That's right. And it's great. It's great. I love this return. I love uh, I love the recurring uh, return of Pelimoto and her the fun she has with the droids. Oh, I I never saw it that way. But you're right. <laughs> you're no, absolutely I know you're right. Doing, yeah, what you're saying about that. So uh, I I just the interconnectedness of the galaxy and and how it all ties together. It's it's so magnificent. It's um, great. He's super reluctant to take this thing because you're thinking, well, he's not going to be able to load any bounties on that, but it's pretty clear that that's not necessarily what he's interested in, This, perhaps. I think he only did it at the beginning to find the armor, really. So now he's able to go sublight uh, because he's got these these impressive sublight thrusters. He doesn't even have to engage his hyperdrive. He doesn't even need um, to use a hyperdrive. I forget the name. I didn't necessarily like the only thing I didn't write down in this whole episode. Um, he doesn't need to use that. He can just go to hyperspace as it is. So he takes it for a test spin. He goes through um, Beggar's Canyon, which brings us to Luke and Anakin and the pod mm-hmm. race. It's even the same course, of course, because yep. it is Beggar's Canyon. How can you not smile at that? And then he gets pulled over. <laughs> he gets pulled over. So one oh. of the one of the X-wing pilots. We don't, it's interesting. There's a blue one and a red one. Usually, yes. we see what the new pilot is. I saw that. Blue. Uh, but I like this episode because you've got a new X-wing pilot that we are not familiar with, mm-hmm. and then we've got a very, very familiar uh, one that is from the Mandalorian. So I, I like that quite a bit. Yeah, and that was fun. And I kind of anticipated that he was going to run into some X-wings. I just, I just had that feel. Feeling. Um, I thought but, Filoni's character, a Trapper Wolf, would be there too. Yeah, and uh, and I like in because I think the recurring character, and I forget the name of his character. He's in the blue X wing, which is more resistance, right? The the resistance yeah. took a blue color. Yeah, and then the other one, I'd love to know. I would love to know the name of the pilot in the um, ah Carson Tiva. Yeah, Carson Tiva. Who, he's a I actually wrote this page too in the Star Wars character encyclopedia. Uh, he's definitely a pilot in the Republic. Um, he is um, he's a pretty high up, really in in the New Republic. He's a captain. He's also a pilot. It was nice to see him. He's a, he's a cool guy. The actor's a cool guy. And as far as being the actor, wasn't he drawn from the Five O First? Yeah. That's so great. He's got a lot of nice, uh, nice. He's also an actor too. He's got a lot of nice mileage out of this. Yeah this this episode in Book of Boba Fett is going to add some pages to that book, sir. I know, I know. I've already been thinking about <laughs> how fun that would be if I get a chance to do something like that again. Um, but uh, he zips but then, out of there we, like light, yeah. like lightning. They don't want to bother doing the paperwork. So we get another classic, you know cop concepts for this western thing. This is another example too of how Boba Fett series is truly uh, western. You know, cowboys, westerns mm-hmm. kind of thing. And Mandalorian isn't cowboy. I mean, that was sort of how it was presented. But he's not a cowboy. He's more like sort of um, 
uh, a hybrid samurai, I think. And he's got oh, his nobility. I, Even the way he talks to them, the way he talks to Pelimoto, the way he does his business, but he's a man of honor and terror. This is exactly the kind of person that Boba Fett's been looking for. Oh, absolutely. Um, and there was a thought that I had, and it's probably insignificant, but it's I found it I find it interesting that while there's a pike, so, you know, a pike invasion of Tatooine, that there is there is representation of the New Republic in the region with these two pilots. Mm-hmm. I just I don't know if that will pot tie into the story or if that was solely placed for the entertainment of <laughs> the Mandalorian, uh, you know, testing out his new ship. But um, but it's, I, I just I found that to be uh, interesting um, and too bad there aren't donuts in Star Wars because that would have been the line that came after the paperwork. Um, but <laughs> so he comes back and uh, and Pelimoto mentions that a friend stopped by uh, to inquire. And, and if I recall correctly, she says she ran him out and set up the security. Uh-huh. And here's what we've been waiting for. We didn't know who the friend would be. I thought I thought it was going to be Boba Fett because that's that's that at this point of the episode that is who I want to see the most as I said at the beginning of the episode. I can't wait to see Boba Fett again, but it's not Boba Fett. No, it's Fennec Shand showing more uh personality than she has in the entire series because I think there's just something about the Mandalorian. Right? It's just a mm. different kind of dynamic. She's great with Fett, but with Din Djarin it's just different. I I don't really know why. It just yeah. is. And maybe that's maybe that's her sort of uh, taking on the persona of us as an audience. I, I mean, I think that works. Uh, she says, you know, big bounty. Um, and then he, th- he she throws him a big uh, sack of credits and he looks mm-hmm. at it and he throws back it's on the house. Yeah, he, that never would have happened before. Again, he has evolved so much. I, I'm so glad that they didn't choose the easy route of he's going to be a sad sack and he's going to be depressed and he's lost Grogu and wah, wah, wah. It's not like that at all. He's evolved. It's yeah. just so inspiring to me. It's so inspiring to me. It's nice to have someone who could have those kind of challenges and and fictional issues, but he doesn't. He doesn't. Yeah. And so at the end, we get the end sentence to end all end sentences. Ooh. I've got to pay a visit to a little friend. And it's over. And Mace looks at me and goes, oh, come on. <laughs> What a brilliant ending. <laughs> and here's something maybe you didn't think about. Rogu's not by himself. No. He's with somebody. Mm-hmm. He's with somebody that we like quite a bit in the world of Star Wars. Mm-hmm. In the world of everything, we like this other character quite a bit. No promises, mm-hmm. no speculation, but we're just dealing no. with what is. We're just dealing with what is, and it's brilliant. I mean, you, you can't... There's This episode, I'm going to say, it, it won't be topped. I don't think it can be topped. And I don't want it to be topped. It doesn't have to be. Mm. It was brilliant. It was wonderful. One of the reasons I liked it so much is because I didn't know anything was going to happen. You know, the Mandalorian, you hoped he was going to show up. You know, it's going to be the Mandalorian as the, the guest star. And I, mm. I think it was an absolute treasure in the world of Star Wars. When he tosses those credits back to her and says, it's on the house. Mm-hmm. There was, there, I had so many... F- emotional feelings about that because it, it kind of brought this sense of like fraternity that yep. they that he and Boba Fett had created. It also mm-hmm. goes back to like honor of being a Mandalorian. It also goes back to um oh uh the like the the um bounty hunter honor mm-hmm. um but but he he returns that it, because the bounty hunter honor is we do each other right and we play by these rules, but we collect the money. So when you talk about growth, there's honor there, there's fraternity, but take the money. I, lo- I, I love the language. It's on the house. Uh huh. I don't know why I like that. It, it's well, like that's Western si- too. Yes. And it's like they're sitting around the table playing uh, Sabak. I think of Lando Calrissian. Lando would never give the money back, mm-hmm. and so it t- that gives you a little bit of like who Din Djarin has become. And just I'm I'm just picturing all of these puzzle pieces coming together because I'll tell you, last episode um, when when Boba Fett says to Fennec Shand that we're going to go to war, but he doesn't have any of the families of the territories. 
He's going it alone. I'm like, he's got a little Vespa <laughs> Vespa gang. He's got Kersantan. He has a Rancor himself. And I mean, that's that's an that's a lot. But we're mm-hmm. talking about the Pikes, which are a, 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 a galactic power of you know spice smuggling, and we've seen how awful they are. In solo, we've seen how awful they are in um, uh, s- season seven of uh, the Clone Wars. I'm like, he he's tough, but is he tougher than the Pikes? Well, I'll tell you, you bring a guy like the Mandalorian in, we're starting to talk. We're going to start evening the odds here. It's funny That's to right. think that one man can do that, but Din Djarin brings quite a bit of clout, and so yes. boy, have we set up. A wonderful episode six. It's going to be spectacular. It really, really is. Well, Tom, thanks for uh, breaking this down with me because this oh. was, it was everything. It was everything. I couldn't wait till you saw it. I can't wait to see what Corey thinks about it. I can't wait to hear what all of you think yeah. about this episode. Return of the Mandalorian. Was there everything you expected? Were you hoping for Mo Boba Fett? Or were you just thinking, you know what? This is the Star Wars pie I wanted to celebrate my Thanksgiving <laughs> of Star Warsness, and it's January. It's great. It's great. Well, Tom, please let everybody know where they can reach out to you and uh, and hear the podcast that you are are running the show on or hosting as well. Oh, absolutely! Thank you. Um, catch me on Twitter. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Book of Boba Fett episode five because there is so much to talk about. And, and Dan, that's one thing I, I've always loved, and we've talked about this before. I love about this show is is the appreciation of the episode just goes up. It just rises as 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 I get to talk to you. As I get we get the feedback from people who listen. So reach out to me on Twitter at Draftline and let me know what you thought. Um, if you're looking for more adventure, but it not in the Star Wars realm, I'd love for you to check out uh, my podcast, Teachers in the Dungeon. We release new episodes every week. Um, check us out. We're at Dungeon Teachers on Twitter, Teachers in the Dungeon on Instagram. Love to have you join us there for some other kind of fantasy adventure. So thanks. It's been a lot of fun. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. 